the Lord, everybody. Why don't we stand on this wonderful Tuesday evening? Last evening, I was browsing through a book, and I came across a chapter where a king was talking to his subjects, and he began to do something interesting to me. He actually began to cut off their long sleeves, which was their traditional dress. And one of them asked why. He said, the reason why I'm doing this is because these things are in your way. There's a lot that you could ponder there, but in prayer tonight, I begin to think about that. And I begin to think, what are the things that are in our way tonight that we could cut out of the way that would allow God to speak to us, that would allow God to move in our lives? Things that aren't really important, things from today that are really, they're beyond our control. They're beyond, they're out of our grasp right now. Why don't we just take those things and why don't we cut them out? Why don't we set them aside? As that king said, these things are in our way. But the king of kings is here tonight. And he wants to minister to us. He wants to spend time with us. So just a few minutes before we even begin worship, before we even begin the song set, why don't we begin to cut those things away? It'll be there after church. It'll be there tomorrow. But just for, for a few minutes tonight, why don't we make our main focus the center of our attention? Why don't we put it on Jesus? We love you, Jesus. We worship you. Thank you for this chance to be in your house, God. Thank you for bringing us into this house, Jesus. Thank you for your hand of protection today. You didn't have to wake us up this morning, God. There's people that didn't wake up this morning. But you woke us up and you kept us through the night. And you kept us through this day, God. You brought us to this house with our brothers and our sisters. For the next little while, God, we're making you the main focus. We're making you the center of attention, Jesus. We're putting our mind on you, God. We're putting our trust back in you, Jesus. We're giving you our worship, Jesus. We're giving you our praise. We're giving you our thanksgiving tonight, Jesus. Thank you for all that you've done, God. Thank you for what you're about to do tonight, God. The word that you have prepared for us. Oh, that's it. Let's just thank you. Isn't it beautiful how he fills the house when we worship him? Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. We praise you, Jesus. We glorify you. We honor you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus.
from the master tonight why don't you ask him come on we got plenty of time why don't you ask God for what do you what, what do you need do you need healed in your body do you need peace in your mind do you you have lost loved ones that you want to come home this is why we're together right now why don't you ask him he said ask what you will in my name huh? believing if you have faith in your heart why don't you begin to ask God for something right now God save my family. God touch my marriage. God save my children. Come on, ask him right now. Hallelujah. Oh, can we do that one more time when your voice is lifted? He's worthy this evening. God, we love you. God, we love you. God, we love you. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. There's a good touch of the Holy Ghost in this place. Amen. I believe in this atmosphere, whatever you would ask, it's able. He's po it's possible in this atmosphere tonight. Amen. If you're willing to step out by faith, he said, whatsoever you should ask in my name, that will I do. Amen. How many believe that this evening, that God's able to heal whatever your situation is? Amen. We serve a God that's able. Thank you, Jesus. We have quite a few that are out sick this evening. 
this bug that's going around is uh, hitting everybody, and I'm praying that it doesn't hit me or my family. Amen. But those that are sick, we know a God that's able to heal and raise them up. Amen. And bring them back whole in Jesus' name. If you have an unspoken request, you can make it known by the lifting of your hand. God sees every need. But if you have a need in your body, maybe it's financial, maybe it's sickness, maybe it's family, whatever the situation is, we know a God that's able. And this time, we're going to invite you to come forward, to step out by faith. We're going to call on the elders of the church. And when we believe that if you're willing to step out by faith, that God will meet you where you're at. He sees every need. There's nothing hid from him. Amen. Why don't we pray this evening? Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. God, your presence that's in this place, what you're doing right now, your unseen hand, God, your healing touch that's in this place. God, you see every need, every situation. God, those that are at home sick, God, with whatever this virus is, God, you're able to raise them up. We plead your blood over them, Jesus, right now. God, would you do a work in their life? Would you touch them, Jesus? Everyone else, God, whatever the situation is, whatever the need is, God, you're able to do it, God. Break bonds and chains, heals body. God, you see financial situations. God, you're our provider. We're calling on your name in the name of Jesus. Would you do it, God? Would you continue the work that you've already begun, Jesus? Right now in this service, God, in the remainder of this service, would you do a work? Would you anoint and go forth, God? Oh, we yield our minds, God. We yield ourselves that your will would be done in this service. We love you, Jesus, with your voices lifted. Why don't we praise him one more time? God, we love you. God, we love you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Is anybody thankful to be alive tonight? He didn't have to wake us up to another day, but he did. It's because of his mercy and his grace.
I've got the best life now. Whoa, whoa. Jesus, I'm alive in you. of the Lord. What a sweet presence of God is in this place. We have just two announcements this evening. Please remember. Actually, you can't remember because we haven't told you yet. So after we tell you, please remember. So there is a youth bake sale on Mother's Day for Mother's Day. You may ask, where does the money from this go? All of the proceeds of all of the fundraisers that the youth are doing right now is to help the youth make it to the WPF in an International Peak Youth Conference. It is a youth conference that is held in Tulsa, Oklahoma this year, and we are doing our best to get as many kids as want to go there, helping them out as much as possible. So there is a fundraiser for that going on Sunday morning, Mother's Day. Following the service, there will be a fundraiser for that. The other announcement is Refuel Night is going to be a blast. You do not want to miss it. Young people, be here at the church at 6 p.m. sharp. The only details I will give you is that you need to bring extra cash for food following the events. So once again, you do not want to miss it. It will begin right here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. Don't worry, we're not going to stay in the sanctuary for long. So 6 p.m., be here, bring a couple bucks for food after all of the fun and all of that. Now, with the announcements out of the way, why don't you reach across the aisle, find somebody you may not know too well, somebody you haven't seen yet tonight. Why don't we shake their hand? Let's welcome them to the house of the Lord.
everybody. It is time to bring our tithe and offering. But I do have one other quick announcement that I failed to ask them to start announcing. June 3rd at 1 p.m. will be the Christian Growth Academy Award Ceremony and graduation right here in the sanctuary. Amen. Sister Miracle Cisneros will be graduating. And Sister Michaela Prendergast will be graduating from, they will both be graduating from high school. So let's come and support them and celebrate with them on a job well done. Amen. Praise God. Let's prepare with our scripture. Let's remember all of our commitments, giving, financially, time, prayer, all of the things we've committed to the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's remember to keep those commitments this week. But the land, whither you go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year, even unto the end of the year. Amen. Let's bring it cheerfully this evening.
joy. You are my joy and my sorrow. You are my hope for tomorrow. You are my peace in the midst of a trouble storm. Come on, here is my joy. somebody and say, I got the joy of the Lord. And high five them again and say, he is my joy. Amen. The world didn't give it. And the world can't take it away. The, this joy I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it. This peace I have, they try to take it on your job. People in traffic, they try to take your joy, try to take your peace, try to take your Holy Ghost. But I got it tonight. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Y'all are a tough crowd tonight. Y'all are very, very tired in the Lord. Amen. Not me either. I had a long day at work. Boss got on my nerves. Co-workers got on my nerves. Had this. Yeah. <laughs> but I got joy tonight. Does anybody have joy in this place? Amen. How many are ready to hear the preaching of the word tonight? How many are ready to hear the preaching of the word tonight? I just want to tell you, if you don't have joy, don't leave this place without getting it. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, don't leave this place tonight. Tonight is your night to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you need a miracle in your life, God can do it tonight. As Bishop comes to preach the word of the Lord, why don't you lift up your hands and ask God to speak to your heart as he comes to preach. Hallelujah. Let's give that praise to God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise. 
Praise God. You know, uh, I would think that some of us are past basic training. In basic training, they're on your case all the time. Come on. Come on. Get with it. But after you've been through a few battles, you realize uh, nobody's going to make me run and stay in shape. But it could mean the difference between life and death. And so you get up and you run, even though maybe nobody else is running. And you get up and you, you go to the gym and you exercise. And you do what it takes because you know that you are, you are enlisted to fight for specific purposes. And the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. I'm quoting from the Bible. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand. If somebody's got to keep pumping you and priming you to praise God, it's possibility you could die in your next battle. Because you haven't realized that praise and worship is not according to how you feel. Praise and worship is a weapon in my life. Hallelujah. And, and I know some of these young service leaders, they get into the calisthenic side of it. And you say, well, it's not all in the running the, in the gunning. Well, it's not all sitting there looking at us like a World War II army blanket draped over a pew either. Somewhere in between some, some of that. So, well, I can't run anymore. Well, you can wave a hand. You can clap your hand. You can shout hallelujah. It's amazing what happens when you begin to praise the Lord and you... You break down the atmosphere, the desultory atmosphere of hopelessness and despair, the melancholy that you've been in all day long. When you praise God, come on now. This is your fight, not ours. This is your victory. This is what God wants you to have. Oh, let's praise him right now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I have been doing some study and I have some meetings coming up that I have to preach at. And so uh, I've been looking at some things. Now, I look at things all the time. I don't want to give you the impression the only time I look at things is when I have meetings to preach. <laughs> but... Uh, while I was looking at some other things, uh, I, this caught my attention. So I want to look at Luke chapter 24, and I want to begin reading at verse number 36. And while I'm doing that, how many of you will be in prayer with us for the double portion, the experience youth convention that is coming up in just a few short weeks. Uh, right around six weeks, I believe, is what we have before that. And uh, I believe that God wants to do some very, very special things. Uh, Evangelist Cornelius Williams will be with us that Thursday night. That Friday morning, uh, Bishop Tom Johnson will be with us. And then that Friday night, Dr. Bart Atkins and I am just absolutely ecstatic about these men of God that God has given to us to speak into our lives. But we want to be in prayer. We want to prepare ourselves for these. In the Bible, these were called holy convocations. Is when people came together for these meetings. And, and, and they go beyond just the regular church service as we thrust into new dimensions and new realms of the Holy Ghost 
It is my prayer that God would break the spirits of deception, the spirits of lackadaisicalness. People have become used to their bondage. They're like the children of Israel in Egypt. And when Moses began to stir up Pharaoh, the people actually complained against Moses and said, Don't do that. You're causing our life to be more miserable. Well, I'm sorry, Pueblo. I'm not going to quit doing this. I'm going to make the kings of the darkness of this city so miserable that they turn God's people loose. Set them free to be who God has called them to be. Praise God. And so I, I seek the prayers and the fasting and the faith of you great people here in this church. As God would use us to bring victory to the young people that will be here. But I'd like to see a bunch of people get the Holy Ghost while this meeting is going on. How many of you are taking cards and at least giving one card a day? Would you please raise your hand? Okay, put your hand down. All of you that are not, would you please raise your hand? If you don't start, I'm getting Brother Godwin back here. (laughs) Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, we are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Luke chapter 24, verse number 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Uh, This is kind of funny. It would be like Jesus walking through this wall right here and telling all of you, Peace be with you. And some of you would be what these people were. But they were terrified. And affrighted. And supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Have you ever thought about the thoughts that you think in your heart when there is terror and fear? And Jesus discerned the thoughts of their hearts and he said, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? And then he gives the key to doing away with the trouble and the terror and the whatever thoughts. He said, let me, let me tell you how to get rid of those thoughts. Take your hand. Behold my hands and my feet. That is, I myself handle me. And see, for a spirit hath not flesh and blood. Touch me. I myself behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me. Touch me. And when you touch Jesus, it has an amazing ability to change how you think. When you touch Jesus, it has an amazing ability to change your attitude. When I see people that are having attitude problems, it becomes obvious to me that they have not touched Jesus recently. Because when you touch him, it changes how you feel, changes how you act, changes how you think. It even changes how you talk. I didn't finish this, but when Thomas touched him, it changed how Thomas talked. 
because until he touched him, he said, unless I touch him and handle him, I just don't have the ability to believe. But when he touched him, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And I want to just focus particularly tonight on his feet. We don't talk a lot about it, but being at the feet of Jesus does some amazing things in our life. So I, I want to preach about being at his feet. But before I do that, could you put your Bibles down and could you lift your hands, brothers and sisters, and reach out and touch the Lord? As he's passing by. You'll find he's not too busy. To deal with the situations. To hear your hearts cry. He's passing by this moment. Your needs to supply. I know it's an old song. But it's true. Reach out and touch the Lord. As he passes by. Come on now. Some of you. You're just going to come in and put in, put in your time tonight. But Jesus wants to touch each and every one of us tonight. You need to push away the thoughts. Some of you, your thoughts have you a million miles away from church right now. And the Lord wants to minister to you, brother. The Lord wants to minister to you, sister. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, come on, come on. Let's gird up the loins of our mind in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. If I were to title this, I would just title it. Behold his feet. You may be seated. Normally when we see this word behold, you think of just looking at whatever you are beholding. But in the case of this scripture, it means more than that. It means to be aware of, it means to hold, to hold his feet. Uh, have you ever thought what must have Mary felt when she pushed her way into that crowded room on that I'm going to use this word, but I, I'm really not a big fan of fate. I don't believe that fate controls my life. I believe that Jesus Christ controls my life. We are not fatalists around here. Fatalists are Calvinist, somewhat. And we're not that. You can get out of the way of that truck. You don't just stand there and say, well, if it's meant to me, the Lord will make that truck just go right over me. No, move. Get out of the way. And uh, many of you struggle with that. I'm going to stop right here and deal with this in doctrine because many of you were Catholics. And I hear even apostolics, especially my Spanish apostolic brothers and sisters, and they will shrug their shoulders and say, well, well what will be, will, will, will be. No, that's not true. What will be is what you determine it will be. If you want to live for Jesus, you can live for Jesus. Don't just shrug your shoulders and say, well, I just don't have any say-so in this. Oh, yes, you do. you got a lot of say-so in it. Well, that's good preaching. Look at your neighbor and say, man, he's preaching good right now. But on that, for lack of a better word, on that fateful day when Jesus is there at the house of his friend Simon the leper 
And this man was no longer a leper. Jesus had healed him. He was proven to be cleansed. And now he is not an outcast. Some, you know, anymore people are so ignorant of scripture. When you tell stories like this, you almost have to stop and explain all of the story as you're going. Before you even get to the message that God has for you. Because here in America, we live in such freedoms. You don't realize that when you had leprosy, you were cut off from the rest of society. You could not live with them. We were in Jerusalem a few months ago. And we were standing on the hill outside of Jerusalem. And we were looking down into the valley of Gehenna. And down below us, uh, there were a bunch of caves and stuff. And I recognized that. And I looked at Eli, our, our guide, and I said, is that where the lepers hung out during Jesus' day? There were caves. There were literally caves down there. And that's where they lived. They lived in community with each other because they could not live in community with anybody else. And they were separated. And that's what Simon the leper had to endure. Although most commentaries that I read about him consider him a fairly wealthy man. Simon the leper was also the father of Judas. Who was known as the Iscariot. And it was in this very house that this scenario takes place. That this woman comes to Jesus and she is panicking. She has heard the rumor on the street that the Sanhedrin are plotting the death of her Lord and her Savior, Jesus. And so this Mary, whoever it is, some people say it were two different Marys. The Bible seems to imply that, and yet I've read where there could be that they were one. Don't know. That's not the point of the story is to get all mixed up in all of the exigencies on the outside of the story. But she is clutching this bottle, this alabaster box. To this day, alabaster, the, the very rock of alabaster is very expensive. I wanted to buy an alabaster chess set while I was in Israel, and I decided that I didn't want to buy an alabaster chess set because I didn't want to pay that kind of money for it, plus the shipping to get it home. But not only was the bottle that she had expensive, but the contents of the bottle were irreplaceable because the contents of the bottle possibly was frankincense, which is to this day very expensive, but is a foundational uh, part of the apothecary when you're making perfume. Frankincense is a very important part of that. Myrrh, which is part of that, which are part of the, the ritual of preparing a body for death. But this bottle goes beyond that because also included in that bottle were the tears of generations of her family, her mom, her grandma, her great-grandma. They would catch the tears because they felt like that there were healing agents to the tears of loved ones. And they would catch the tears of those loved ones. And they would, they would put them in this bottle and they would seal that in the bottle. So all of the emotional implications that all she had left of her mama was her tears. All that she had left of her grandmother were the tears of her grandmother. And the closeness that she felt to these people of time past that meant so much to her that most, in fact the Bible says that that was such an expensive perfume that she had that it was worth a year's wages. Now, I haven't checked. The last time I checked, 
a year's wages in the United States of America is right around $53,000 a year. That is on average. Some of you say, well, I don't make that yet. Well, pay your tithe and offering, live faithful before God, and you'll make a lot more than that one day. I wish you all believed that. Some of you are already making more than that. God wants to bless you. Why do people resist blessing? Why does the human spirit bow up and say, well, that may be for somebody else, but that's not for me. Of course it's for you. You're God's children. He wants to bless you. Be that as it may, $53,000 for a bottle of perfume is expensive. And yet, the Lord meant so much to her. She had no way of showing how devoted that she was to him. She had, this was the only way that she could communicate to the Lord Jesus Christ how valuable he was to her. It was, he was more valuable to her than all of the memories of her mother and her grandmother and her great-grandmother and whoever else that was involved in passing down this heirloom, this alabaster box that had come from generation to generation until it is hers. And I'm not preaching about her. I will come back and preach about her because there's a whole message in this, this account. But... It's fascinating to me because in this culture, women did not have the freedom and the, what our world terms, equality that we have in our day and age. Women were basically servants and baby makers. And if they couldn't make babies, they were discarded. And they would find another woman. And, and so uh, this lady had been pilfered and abused and perhaps the only man that ever really treated her like a lady was Jesus Christ. And the bond and the connection that was made between this Savior of hers and herself went beyond ways to describe it was part of her duties to wash dirty feet. And so she thought nothing of taking this expensive stuff and breaking the seal on this alabaster box and taking the contents that had been in her family for generations and pouring it on the feet of our God and our Savior, pouring it on his feet and anointing his feet with this content and then taking her beautiful hair. How do I know that they had long hair in the Bible? Because the Bible says they did. Ladies had long hair. I, I rather doubt that they had long hair on men or else Paul would have told us it would have been all right for men to have long hair. And Paul makes it very clear that from the beginning of time that covenant people with God the men had short hair and the women had long hair Paul was a Jew if it was a practice for Jews to have long hair he would have made it very clear it's very evident that that was not the case here and so in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 he talks about this but this lady had long enough hair that she takes her hair and begins to massage his feet with her hair. Now the Bible says in one gospel that all of the apostles, all of the disciples were furious with her. The Bible makes it clear that in one gospel the disciples were very upset at her. And I believe it's in the book of John that Simon, the, the host of this occasion, 
was angry with her. And Judas was angry with her. And Peter was angry with her. And then the Bible says in another gospel that all of them that were there was angry with her. There was only one other person in that building besides her that was not angry with her. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and let me just go this far with this story to let you know that if God is pleased with your worship, then who cares what everybody else thinks? Who cares what everybody else says? Who cares who else is angry? Who cares what they say? If Christ is pleased with this and the Lord accepts her worship. Now, brothers and sisters, I cannot fathom this. And maybe that's why the men were angry because they hadn't learned the value of the feet of Jesus yet and did not learn it until that fateful night or that night of destiny where Jesus arises from the Last Supper. And the Bible says he throws off his garment and he puts on the towel of a servant and he begins to do the same thing. And all over again it's played out. They get angry with him again. And he comes to Peter and he's going to wash Peter's feet. And Peter stands up in his self-righteousness. And he says, Not so, Lord. Thou shalt never wash my feet. Peter had a wonderful ability. He was so agile, he could frequently stick his foot in his mouth. You notice that about Peter? And Peter... Y'all are quiet, but I'm going to tell you something. I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm going to preach tonight. And Peter looks at Jesus in his anger, and the rest of the atmosphere is in shock as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords reaches down and touches their feet and begins to wash the filth off of their feet. What is it about our, our sense of righteousness? What is it about our pride that we try to cover our filthiness from Jesus Christ? And we come to church like some of us tonight, and there are desperate needs here, but our attitudes are so out of whack that while Jesus is trying to work with us, there's an anger an anger that rises up against Brother Darius. Don't talk to me like that, Brother Darius. I don't feel like worshiping God tonight. Don't talk to me. I've had a rough day today. But what would it be like if we understood that's not Brother Darius? That's not Brother Richard playing the the keyboard that's not brother Mitchell playing that's not sister Melody or whoever else is leading the singing tonight that's the body of Christ that has come to minister and bring cleansing and wash us uh, and purge us uh, and you're part of that your response back to that can I tell you like Jesus told Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part in my kingdom. I don't want to be like that. Every service I come in here, I want there to be communion between me and my Lord and my Savior. I don't know about you tonight, but I need Jesus. I said, I need Jesus. I don't know what I face for the rest of this week. But I'll tell you this. If I can touch him, it'll change my whole attitude. If I can touch him, he'll turn my unbelief into faith. If I can touch him, he'll bring healing to my mind. Some of you come in here tonight and there's things in your life 
that Satan has you so in bondage that you don't think you can get victory over them. And the way you talk belays that you don't think you can vic get victory. And you've already given up. And you, you've you come here to sit on a pew tonight and act religious and keep that secret sin in your life and realize uh, I, I, there's nothing I can do about it. But if I can get you to Jesus, if you can touch him tonight, uh, if you can touch him, you can be like Thomas. Behold, my Lord and my God, uh, you can walk out of here with faith in your heart. That one touch changed Thomas' life forever. A few weeks ago, I was reading. I don't remember what I was reading. I'll think of it here about 3 o'clock in the morning. I was reading. Oh, I know what I was reading. I was reading about Magellan. How many of you know who Magellan is? Well, thank, thank God two of you know who Magellan is. Let me tell the rest of you who Magellan was. Magellan is the one that's given the credit for totally circumventing the world. Now, he really didn't. There, was a, there actually was a, a black man with him that did it. But back in those days, they didn't want to give credit to those people, so they gave it to Magellan. Magellan didn't quite make it. He made it to Cebu Island in the Philippines, and in Cebu, uh, the, the, actually the guy that did make it got mad at him and talked to some other people, and they killed him. But before Magellan started on his journey to circumvent the world, or circumnavigate, let me use the right term. Poke your neighbor and say, are you listening? Before Magellan circumnavigated the world, he was a soldier and they sent him to India. And while he was at India, they went to a certain province, can't remember the name of the province, and he writes in his diaries, and I'm frantically looking for this because I haven't found it yet. I've just found what the author said about this. But he found in the diary, he wrote in his diaries that he found a, a Christianity that was neither Protestant nor Catholic. But it was started by Thomas the Apostle. So whatever happened when Thomas touched the feet of Jesus totally changed his life and history tells us that Thomas died as a martyr in the land of, of India did I say Egypt in the land of India and while he was in India uh, he established an apostolic word that's why Magellan was so amazed by it because it was neither apostolic or, or neither Catholic nor Protestant I'll tell you what it was it was apostolic because something happened when Thomas touched him. I will say that prayers are answered at the feet of Jesus. Brother Richard, come, I'm almost finished. In Mark chapter 5, verse number 22, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when... He saw Jesus, look what he does. He fell at his feet. He fell at his feet. And while he was there at the feet of Jesus, come here, Brother Abe, please. When he was younger, I could say it, but he's a grown man now, so i got to add the please on there. Stand right there. See, you don't understand in the, in the culture of the East, when it says that he fell at his feet, that means that he made himself prostrate at the feet of this man. And he is pleading with him. He besought him. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that prayers are answered at the feet of Jesus some of us have got so important in our own mind that we don't know how to come to the feet of Jesus thank you brother Abe we don't know how to come to the feet of Jesus but it was at the feet of Jesus 
that he besought him and he said my my little daughter I don't know where sister one is there she is what's the little girl's name Aaliyah you know some of us just want to pass that right on over I'm not going to pass that right on over I watched I think it was Sunday night as little Aaliyah was back there and her hands were raised and she was worshiping Jesus it may not have been that way My little girl is at the point of death. Maybe some of you just don't need him enough. Maybe it's because we have our we have our good jobs. I read that that one of the most one of the greatest expenses of this inflation one of the greatest expenses of this inflation is wages. Wages have went up drastically, but here's the sad thing. Inflation is growing faster than wages. But some of us, we think, I've got more money than I've ever had before. I don't need Jesus but I'll tell you something. There's some things in life your money can't do. There's some things in life your money can't buy. And there's nothing that takes the place of falling at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible makes it very clear that prayers are answered when we fall at the feet of Jesus. I will tell you this, Christian Growth Center, I don't ever want to get used to giving an altar call and watching you people sit back there in those pews. I know there's churches today that are doing that. Let me tell you new converts something. Don't get in a habit of sitting back there when the altar call is given. Don't sit back there. If you're new in this church... And I know there are many churches that have totally done away with the altar. They will pack chairs all the way up because they don't need any shouting space because nobody shouts there. They don't need any aisle. We really don't have big enough aisles around here. Some of these young people are worshiping and some of them are practicing for track. But hopefully while they're practicing they'll encounter Jesus. Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Now, parents, that doesn't give them an excuse to go nuts. Please watch and pray that your kids enter not into temptation. And they have done away with the altar. And you can go to those churches and you can sit on a pew and somebody will give a really good speech about Jesus or one of his disciples. And you will sit there and you will think, man, that sounds so good. Man, they're a really good speaker. And then they will give the benediction and everybody will stand up. And instead of moving towards the altar, they get up and they walk out. And they call that church today. And nobody has touched Jesus. Nobody has encountered the presence. I don't have time to tell you about Jairus. I don't have time to tell you about the journey that he makes with Jesus after Jesus lifts him up from his feet. I don't have time to tell you about the fears and the concerns that come to him until finally a servant comes from his house and says, Suffer not the master anymore. Thy daughter is dead. And the only words that he hears from Jesus 
in that whole journey is Jesus turns and look at him and says, fear not. Only believe. But that one encounter keeps him walking with Jesus. That one encounter at the feet of Jesus keeps him walking with Jesus till Jesus walks in his house and walks up to the bed of that daughter that lies there with the life passed from her. And Jesus looks at her and tells her, get up, child. Prayers are answered at the feet of Jesus. Devils are cast out at the feet of Jesus. In Mark 7, 25, for a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and, and came and fell at his feet. The woman wasn't even a Jew. She was a Greek. A Syrophoenician woman by nation. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. And you know what Jesus does? He tells her. This is the story where he says it's not me to give. The, uh, it's not right for me to give what belongs to the children, the meat that belongs to the children, to dogs. But this woman was so determined. Now get it in your mind. All of this is going on while she is lying prostrate at the feet of Jesus. All of this is going on while she has knelt before him with her face at his feet. I can't give this to you. And with her face buried in the dirt in front of his feet, she sobs out, Yea, Lord. Woo, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. And Jesus says unto her, in verse number 29, if you want to put it up there. And he said unto her, for this saying, Go thy way. When you get home, the devils will be gone from your daughter. She didn't even have to take him home. All she had to do was fall at his feet. And that encounter between her and her Lord brought deliverance for her daughter. Brothers and sisters, I'm preaching about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I'm preaching about what happens when we'll humble ourselves and come to the feet of Jesus and seek his face. Reach out and touch him. Luke 7 and 44 tells us there's forgiveness at the feet of Jesus. turned to the woman and said unto Simon this is the one I started out with see thou this woman I entered into thine house and thou gavest me no water from my feet but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with hairs the hairs of her head thou gavest me no kiss but this woman since I came here hath not ceased to kiss my feet my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto, wherefore I say unto thee, her sins be forgiven her. Her sins, which are many, be forgiven her. Let me tell you how to get out of your sin, brother and sister. Just come to his feet. Come on, sis. Say, brother elder, I, I don't know what to do. Just keep coming to his feet. Just keep coming to this altar. I, I don't have time to preach all of this. 
This looks like an altar here, but when you get to heaven in Revelation chapter 4, you'll find out this ain't the altar. This is the throne of God. And when you come to this altar, you are standing at the feet of God. And it's from this altar, this throne, that he administers judgment, that he administers healing, that he administers deliverance. Uh, I know people have taken the altar out of their church, and they're saying it's symbolic. And I know you can build an altar anywhere in your life, but in the body of Christ, when we come together to assemble, it's right here that it represents that we are standing before the throne of God at his feet. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. Maybe that's the problem. How much do we love Jesus? How much do we love Jesus? To whom little is forgiven? Simon. Simon! You were rejected by society. Why are you judging this woman now? Why is it that, that those that God has forgiven the most sometimes can be the most judgmental? Those that have sins that none of us even know about. Sins that occurred in your life, sir, years ago. As I preach this, I feel like saying this. Sins that may have occurred in another nation and you thought are hid from everybody else. And yet when you come to this altar, Simon, I didn't only forgive you, I cleansed you of your leprosy. This woman hadn't ceased Luke chapter 17 tells us in verse number 16. I know I'm almost done, but I got to get through this tonight. I'm going to tell you how powerful this altar is. I'm coming against the spirit that wants to pressure me or any other preacher in here to just marginalize this off this altar. To just make it easy for you to, to just stand up and leave the house of God tonight without coming before throne of God to obtain help in the time of trouble help is on the way brothers help is on the way the Bible says and fell down on his face at his feet giving thanks and he was a Samaritan this is another case of leprosy Another case of brokenness, of open sores, of infection and pus and stench and rejection. Nobody else would let him get close, but they come to Jesus, ten of them. And they said, would you have mercy on us? And the Bible said, Jesus said, I will. And right then he healed them. And they saw their healing and they ran, except for one of them. Maybe got 50 feet, 100 feet down the road as he's running. And he, and he realizes, hold on. Nobody's ever done that for me before. Hang on. I, I got to let this guy know. I, I can't go any further. When he saw that he was healed, he turned back with a loud voice. Thank you, Lord. I, I, I can't leave this house tonight. I can't walk out of here tonight, God, before I let you know. I'm grateful for healing me of this sin. I'm grateful. And unbeknownst to him, when he fell down at the feet of Jesus, he wasn't only healed. The Bible said he was made whole. All of the brokenness, all of the disfigurement, 
that leprosy had done in his life miraculously is healed and he is made whole. Brothers and sisters, that's an incredible miracle. There's resurrection power at the feet of Jesus. John eleven thirty two. 32. When Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet and said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Verse number 43 says, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice and said, Lazarus! She didn't even realize it. She was kneeling at the feet of resurrection. I'm telling you in this, in this altar tonight, there's resurrection for your marriage. There's resurrection for your life. There's resurrection for your spirit. There's resurrection for your faith. There's resurrection. He is the resurrection in life. There's mercy at his feet. John 6 and, or John 8 and 3, and the scribe and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. She didn't realize that the safest place they could have thrown her was at the feet of Jesus. You've heard me preach it. If what they said is true, she was caught in the very act. If she was caught in the very act, there's no telling how she was dressed. The shame that she had to bear, perhaps walking in front of her husband and her children as they drug her out and threw her at the feet of Jesus next verse please and they say unto him master this woman is taken in the very act of adultery and there she lays crumpled I'm telling you tonight you got to hear me there's something mystically powerful about being at the feet of Jesus. I said there's something mystically powerful about being at the feet of Jesus. They are ready to pick up stones and while she lays there on her face sobbing, Jesus kneels down beside her in the dirt and begins to whatever. I don't know what he wrote in the dirt. Everybody tries to make a big deal out of it. If he'd have wanted us to know, he'd have told us. But I'll tell you what he was doing. He was getting close to that little child of his. Something about being at the feet of Jesus emits from him the mercy because he is mercy personified. And as they rant and they rave and some of them may have even picked up stones but they knew by the law they could not throw a stone until the high priest had given the verdict and they tried to snare him and say what will you do and Jesus gave the commandment let him which hath no sin cast the first stone Quietly, they drop the stones and they begin to walk away. And when all of them were gone, sometimes we leave too soon because Jesus does some of his best work when it's just him and us at, our, at his feet. And everybody else was gone. And Jesus looks at that sobbing woman and said, Woman, where are thine accusers? He said, she said, Lord, they're all gone. He said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Let's stand. There's so much power 
at the feet of Jesus because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, For he must reign till he hath put all things under his feet. Maybe that's why the devil wants you sitting back there, standing back there. Because he knows that all power is under his feet. He's going to put it under, he's going to put your drug addiction under his feet. If you'll keep coming and spending time with him. He's going to put your depression and your wrong thinking under his feet. It's going to be like Thomas, you read out and reach out and touch him. And, and your thinking's going to change. Ephesians 1, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. It's an honor for you to come and stand at his feet tonight or kneel at his feet or bow or, or lie prostrate at his feet tonight. It's an honor because the Bible says, and he had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things, even his church. And the Bible lets us know the first thing we will do when we get to heaven. In Revelations 1, and when I saw him, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I were dead. Ephesians 1 and 17, please. And he laid his right hand upon me and saying, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and I am the last. Praise God. I'll never forget a story and I'm, I'm done. I, if you want to come to the altar, you come to the altar. While you're coming... We had, a, we had a family in our church. My mom and dad won. They were a, he was a Church of God pastor. And it was Gary and Mary Bueller. There were struggles in their life. I will never forget the Sunday night that Mary Bueller finally broke through in the Holy Ghost. And that woman wept and spoke in tongues and cried and got lost in the Holy Ghost and shouted and danced. She even ran the aisles one time and finally, in such exuberance and elation, she fell on her face in front of the, the pulpit in the altar that night and she wept and talked in tongues for maybe two hours. And while she wept and talked in tongues, God gave her a vision. I was standing by my father when she looked up at him, tears all over her face. Her face lit up with the glory of God as she had been in the presence of God for so long. She said, Brother Elder, I saw him. I saw the Lord tonight. I saw him. I saw him. And I was at his feet. And I was worshiping him. And he reached down and he touched me. If I remember right, he called her his daughter. And then she lapsed off into the Holy Ghost again with her face upraised on her knees in that altar. Hands uplifted, speaking in tongues, weeping and crying. Just a few hours later, Gary Bueller called us sobbing. Said Mary died in her sleep. She rolled over and mumbled something about praising Jesus. And that was the last that she ever saw of this world. She saw it. She called it that night. She called it good that night, didn't she? She was at his feet. Maybe that scares you. If it does, then you need to come and spend time with him till you're not scared to be at his feet. But I'm telling you, I feel this in the Holy Ghost, and I know it's a Tuesday night, and normally these are Bible study nights, 
But I can't give you a greater Bible study than for you to just spend a few minutes in this altar. Maybe you want to kneel. Maybe you want to get acquainted with this altar. This is, this is the throne of God. I know it's symbolic, but, but this is all that we have right now. At his feet, I told you, I showed you in his word, there's forgiveness at his feet. There's healing at his feet. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe there's things in your future you're so uncertain about. Why don't you come and spend a little time at his feet tonight? Can you just spend a little time at his feet? young lady at your feet Come on. Maybe there's things about your future you're not certain of. Bring them to the feet of the Master. Bring them to His feet.
Come on. Make this altar your friend. This altar is your friend. It's here you're close to him. You can touch him. talk to Jairus. Let him talk to you like he talked to the lepers. Let him talk to you. He'll tell you, fear not. Just follow me. When we get to the end, your prayer will be answered.
all stand and let's worship him right now. Can we love him and praise him? Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands. Lift our voices. Give him the worship and the praise that he's worthy of. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love you and we honor you, Jesus. We love you and we praise you, O oh God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of Jesus. God, I worship you and I honor you. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're celebrating the graduation of Sister Miracle and Sister Michaela. Where's, where's Michaela? There she is. But we're also, Sister Jada is graduating, and so is Sister Naomi. Congratulations on this tremendous accomplishment. You've given 13 years of your life. In my case, I gave 14 because I failed the eighth grade. But at least I had the tenacity to stay after it actually graduated valedictorian so God can work miracles believe it or not praise God but uh, let's remember that let's let's spend time at his feet brothers and sisters the world is passing by the old song says just to walk with him is everything to me just to know his tender hand is leading me though the world may pass me by go her way and let me be how many of you think there's times in our life that you just maybe we need to go on a social media fast get rid of that trash you'll find out your life will be just fine probably better Without social media the world survived tremendously without social media praise God get off of the rat race come and spend time at the feet of Jesus realize that all of the hard work that you're doing is for nothing if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ how many of you will take time this week and say, okay, God, I'm going to spend this time with you. Come on, lift your hands and commit yourself to it. Get off of the, get off of the merry-go-round. I, I'm going I'm to spend time with the Lord Jesus. Let's give him another high praise before we leave this house tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's remember Sister Quintana. I don't know if she's out of the hospital yet. I talked to her this morning and she's still struggling with fluid on her lungs. Let's pray that God will help them find out what's going on. And then Sister Shirley called me. She was sick tonight. So let's remember these people in prayer as we pray. God bless you. Love one another. You are dismissed. <laughs>